Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you here. Um, I'm going to talk today about whether or not we can live in the donut. And I apologise for talking about junk food, especially as part of a programme that's looking at the future of food. And of course, we should eat less junk food. But I'm hoping to introduce you today to one donut that actually might be good for us. And I want to start by talking about my own journey into this kind of thinking. I trained as an economist, as a development economist, about 20 years ago, and was very frustrated with the economics that I was taught. I felt that it didn't equip me to address the social and environmental challenges that I was interested in addressing in the world. And so I effectively walked away from economics for a long time. But of course you can't wait, walk away from economics because it's all around us. It's the language that we discuss public policy in, it's actually embedded in the decisions we're making every day. And that's what's brought me back to it. And one of the main ways we think about the economy is in terms of global economic growth and GDP growth. And this is what's happened to global economic growth um, over, you could say, a long view since 1870 to 2010, projected forward to 2050. So even since 1970, the value of the global economy, the value of economic activity has quadrupled. And on mainstream predictions, it's expected to quadruple again by 2050. And our politicians know that not everything that we care about is coming along with economic growth, right? It's entailing environmental degradation. It's leaving many millions of people left behind in severe human deprivation. And we're facing widening inequalities as we go. So it's no surprise that when our politicians talk about growth, they're increasingly trying to add new words to describe better qualities of growth. They talk about sustained growth or sustainable growth, resilient Inclusive, green growth is the flavour of the day, or maybe just greener growth. Balanced, equitable, strong, lasting. And to me, it's very interesting that politicians are searching for all these additional terms to add to this idea of growth, because it shows that it doesn't capture what we actually care about. And so it's no surprise that when Amartya Sen, Joseph Stiglitz and Professor Petusi came together and led a commission in 2008 to look at rethinking the measures of economic development and social progress. They said, those attempting to guide the economy and our societies are like pilots trying to steer without a reliable compass. And I particularly like these pictures of the pilots with no compass in their hands, but grasping for concepts that we don't yet have to talk about the kind of future that we want to design. And the language of growth isn't getting us there. So I thought, well, what if we could put a compass in their hands? What if we could actually spell out the goals that we have and then ask ourselves what kind of economy would take us there rather than starting with the economy and worrying that it wasn't achieving some of the goals we cared about. So let's step back from thinking about GDP growth and take a really long view. Here's the last 100,000 years of life on this planet. And what you can see here is the temperature of ice cores. And you can see some very clear things. It's varied hugely over the last 100,000 years. And then just in the last... 10 to 12,000 years, it's been incredibly stable. And that last 10 to 12,000 years is the period of the Earth's history known as the Holocene. And it's scientists say it's no coincidence that humanity migrated out of Africa, um, migrating across South Asia to Europe, and that it's oh, no coincidence that it was just in the Holocene that agriculture began. Because it was in the Holocene period of a much more stable climate that we could rather than hunt and gather, actually start to expect seasons and predict seasons and rely upon seasons and start to plan and harvest our food. So the Holocene has given us agriculture. And indeed, every great human civilization, every human civilization has grown up in the Holocene. It's the era of human prosperity. And it's given us the benevolent conditions to multiply and provide for ourselves. It's extremely benevolent phase of the planet's history. So we'd be crazy to kick ourselves out of the Holocene without even knowing what we were doing. And that's why a group of, uh, sorry, let me just go, I, before I jump on, I find that a really fascinating moment in history because a group of Earth system scientists are now saying, what is it about the Holocene that defines this phase? What are the critical Earth systems we depend upon to keep us in that stable phase of the planet's history? And to me, that's a really fascinating question that they're asking. Because it's since the 14th century in Europe, since 1,000 years ago in China, that people have been asking, how does the human body system work? What are the critical systems that keep the human body alive? How does this heart 
and blood system relate to this digestive system? And what's this nervous system? How do these things interact? And how much pressure can we put on any of these systems before we push them over a limit and actually kill ourselves? How long can you go without water? How high can your temperature get before it kills you? How fast can your heart beat before it gives you a heart attack? So that we know that we have many interdependent systems within the human body. They affect each other and that there are limits to pressure we would ever put on them. And that's why we've mastered human biology so successfully. We've been doing it for centuries. But it's only now in the 21st century that Earth system scientists, I think of them as planetary doctors, are starting to ask the same question about the planet. What are the critical systems that keep the planet in this Holocene phase that's been so incredibly beneficial to humanity? And what are the limits of pressure that we can put on any of one of those systems? And how do they interact with each other? So these are the questions that the Earth System scientists are asking. Led by Johan Rockström at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, Will Steffen, based at the Australian National University, and many other Earth System scientists who came together and tried to say, can we define a set of critical Earth system processes that we think are the key ones for keeping us in the Holocene? And they came up with nine, which I'm sure are very familiar to many of you, the nine planetary boundaries. Uh, so climate change, not putting out so many greenhouse gases that we cause climate change, not withdrawing or changing the water cycles and withdrawal of water from lakes and rivers so that we actually transform the water cycle not using so much nitrogen and phosphorus in agriculture that it leaches out into lakes and oceans and causes eutrophication. Uh, again, not emitting so much carbon dioxide that it dissolves in the ocean and causes ocean acidification, killing ocean life and the, the chain of um, the life cycle in there. Chemical pollution, a huge range of chemicals that they mentioned, that fr from persistent organic pollutants to nuclear waste. How are these interacting with the, the web of life? Atmospheric aerosol loading, which can actually change monsoon patterns. Ozone depletion, we know about that one, and we've got the Montreal Protocol, which said let's come back from that boundary. So that's a great sign that we've actually done something about it. Biodiversity loss, this image shows um, soybean monoculture as opposed to natural forest. And the loss of that diversity, again, reduces our resilience in the face of other pressures. And land use change, likewise, if we transform the surface of the land, from its original use, we reduce the, the resilience of the system when it faces shocks in any of these other dimensions. So they said, here are the nine planetary boundaries, and if we can stay within that space, it's a safe operating space for humanity. And they went one step further and said, if these are the nine boundaries, where do we think the limits of pressure are that we can actually put? And of course, this is early science. We're only just beginning to do this. So they began giving their first estimates. And they said, let's let estimate where the boundaries are. We can't actually specify the tipping point the, the, right, we can't actually specify where that system will shift. We can say a safe boundary. And I like this image to, to get your head around the idea of that biophysical threshold, which is the tipping point, and the boundary, which is the safe space away from it. So this guy is a little bit crazy. He hasn't gone over the tipping point, but he's way too close to it. Right? He's, he's passed what you would consider a safe boundary. So the boundary is not that moment of transformation. It's the safe distance, because we don't actually know where... where all these waterfalls are in the natural systems, but we want to stay upstream from them so we stay a safe space away from them. So the planetary boundary scientists said, let's try and estimate where we think, using a precautionary principle, where that boundary is that we shouldn't go beyond because we risk going over the tipping point. And they came up with uh, numbers, putting first estimates on seven out of the nine boundaries. So the climate change one is the most familiar, and it's you know carbon dioxide, we shouldn't go beyond 350 parts per million. But likewise for nitrogen, their first estimate we should have no more than three, 35 million tonnes of reactive nitrogen going out into the atmosphere because we believe this puts us at risk of going over a nitrogen boundary. So this was their first estimate. And of course, these are all drawn distinctly, separate on, on this uh, spiral, with each graph starting at the point of zero in the centre and going out to the boundary and then beyond. And you can see we've gone over on climate change, we've gone way over on nitrogen and on biodiversity loss. In fact, if the biodiversity loss diagram was complete, it would probably hit the outer wall and the nitrogen one would come all the way out to here three or four times over on nitrogen use and on the other ones they estimate that we're moving towards those boundaries and of course these different dimensions interact we don't yet fully understand how but here's a graphic that i really like i've only recently come across it by johannes friedrich who was working at the stockholm resilience center last year and he took each of the different climate uh, each of the different boundaries and tried to map according to estimates that the scientists together came up with rough estimates of the amount that they think they influence each other. 
So you can see the land system changes influencing many of the other boundaries. The climate system up there in blue is influencing many other boundaries. So you can see the interrelationships starting to come out. Really nice visualization, I think, of starting to show that interrelationship of these different boundary pressures. So they have the nine boundaries, and they said, if we can stay in that space and not go over any of them, then we're in a safe operating space for humanity. I find that a really compelling frame. And as an economist, I was very excited. I had this huge adrenaline rush the first time I saw it, because I felt as if it was natural scientists saying to economics, look, if you won't draw an, the, the economy inside a box and label it an environment and recognize that the economy is a subset of the environment, well, if you won't do that, we're going to do it for you. Here it is, and we've drawn it in our metrics. So now you have to talk in other metrics. You can't monetize everything. You have to talk in natural metrics. You're going to have to learn somebody else's language. So I found this a really exciting moment of rebalancing between disciplines and bringing in that out of frame to the economy. And I was sitting inside Oxfam at the time thinking, right, that's what natural science is doing to, to counterbalance the domination of economic thinking. What, from a natural justice, a social justice perspective, should we be bringing in return? And I thought, well, that point at the centre of the diagram, they've said that whole circle is a safe operating space, but the point at the centre is where humanity is putting no pressure on these planetary systems. And there's 7 billion of us, and there's going to be 9 billion soon. I can't see that a point where we put no pressure on the planet's systems is going to be a safe place for humanity. In fact, I think there's a circle in the middle that you want to get out of, because if you're in that space, surely there's going to be people living in deprivation people who don't have enough access to the resources they need to meet their human rights to water, to food, to health, to have an income, to have an education, to be resilient, to have a voice, have jobs, access to energy, and to have these things with social equity, without extreme inequalities within a society, and also gender equality. So just as there are an outer limit of environmental pressure beyond which lies tipping points, which undermine the benevolent state of the planet for humanity, so too in the centre there's a space of human de deprivation that we don't want to be as below the point of resource use. So it's actually a balance between the two. And you could say, well, where did these 11 dimensions I just listed come from? The planetary boundary scientists got together, a group of leading Earth system scientists, and between them came up with the nine critical dimensions. My response to that, I, I couldn't convene the world's leading social thinkers and come up with the leading, leading uh, dimensions that they thought, but what I did, it was just in the run-up to the Rio Plus 20 conference, so I went through every single government's submission to Rio Plus 20. What were the social priorities that they were calling for in their submissions? And I picked out those social issues that more than half of the governments mentioned. So these are the 11 issues that more than half governments mentioned. That doesn't mean they're exactly the right ones. It doesn't mention housing. It doesn't mention personal security. It doesn't mention communications, for example. But it's a very strong set from my point of view, because if any government said to me, well, this is a very Western concept, or, you know, where did you get this from? I said, no, this is, this is from you. This is crowdsourced from the world's governments. So these are the priorities of the world's government. So it's an international set of priorities. doesn't mean it's complete, and I think it could change. Just as the understanding of planetary boundaries is continually evolving, our understanding of what that social foundation could be can continually evolve. So when you put that in the center, and you put the whole thing together, you actually get not a circle, but a donut shape. Because you don't want to be in a space in the middle, that's human deprivation. And you don't want to be over the outside edges, that's environmental degradation. You actually want to be in the safe and socially just space in between. Because that is the only place where we can thrive, by definition. So there's the fundamental drawing, and, and I've written there inclusive and sustainable economic development, because I, then I say any economic development that is inclusive has to be in that space, because it, by definition people aren't living in poverty. And if it's sustainable, it's going to be in that space, because it's within planetary boundaries. And to me, the question is, what does that economic development look like? And that's one of the questions that drives me. But I've been fascinated by how many people responded to this diagram and have used it as a starting point for many conversations. And I wanted to say, well, just as the planetary boundary scientists estimated, where are we in relationship to those planetary boundaries? I said, where are we in relationship to the social foundation? And used United Nations data for eight of the 11 for which I could get internationally comparable data. And you can see that we're below the social foundation for all of them. So for example, take the food boundary, that blue band stands for the 13% of people in the world who don't have enough food to eat. Whereas the orange wedge represents the 87% of people who do. So 
on all those dimensions, if everybody had the resources they need to meet these human rights, the whole of the central circle would go orange. We'd come out from under that foundation. But you can see that on every dimension there are people living in poverty. And when we put the two together, I think this is a very strong picture of where we are today and the compass for where humanity needs to get to this century. We are over the planetary boundaries, over at least three of them, while over a billion people still live under the social foundation. And to me, one statement of the 21st century challenge for humanity is to come back within planetary boundaries and get everybody out over that social foundation. So meet the human rights of everybody within the means of this one planet. And as a generational challenge, that's a pretty extraordinary challenge. If we could be the generation that started to turn this around, that would be an extraordinary achievement. So I would like to put that compass in the hands of politicians. And we can, again, as I showed you the systems diagram that showed the interlinkages between the planetary boundaries, we can start to think about the interlinkages between the social foundation and the planetary boundaries too. And just a very simple example, if you care about producing more food, you say, you know, we need to produce more food because the global population is increasing, and people's estimates about how much more food is needed is political and contested, but let's say you thought, right, we need to produce more food, how could you do that? Well, many of the different ways in which you could produce more food can put pressure on all these different kinds of systems depending upon how you do it. And we know that if you put too much pressure on those systems, that there are, of course, feedback loops that will come back and affect so many different aspects of humanity. So these things are interdependent. You can't just produce more food and transforming the planet's uh, life support systems without recognizing that it's going to have impacts back on different dimensions of human well-being. So it's all very interrelated. I've drawn these arrows very simply, but I think there's a really an interesting task sitting there for somebody saying, right, I'm going to actually do these arrows properly and, and do an analysis there. That, that would be a great project. So what if you could take this table and put your life on this table, sit around it and think, how does, how does my life interact with this diagram of social and planetary boundaries? How does the way that I consume, travel, shop, vote, educate, affect humanity's ability to get into that space? What if every company had a board table, a strategizing table with this on the table, and they asked themselves, you know, is our brand a donut brand? As one, there's one uh, branding company in London that has started saying to their companies, are you a donut brand? You know, what are you doing about the impacts on people in your supply chain? Are you respecting workers' rights? Are you providing consumers with healthy products? Are you actually pro producing in ways and helping people to provide things that get them over the social foundation? And what kind of pressure are you putting on the planetary boundaries? How could you stand up as a company and say, look, this is the journey we've made over the last 10 years. I can think of some very progressive companies that would run to this table to tell you the story about the progress they've made in terms of respecting people's rights and reducing their carbon emissions, and reducing water use, and the progress they've made over the last 10 years, and then the progress they know they still need to make over the next 10 to come into that space. I also know plenty of companies that would walk right out of the room and stay very far away from that table because they don't like the story it tells about them. But what if we could get the world's governments to meet around a table like this. Okay, that's not actually the world's governments, that's Dr. Strangelove. But the, I, I presented this at the United Nations um, last year and said to them, you need a new table. You know, imagine if you were negotiating around a table that actually had in front of you the vision of where humanity wants to get to. Wouldn't that help you negotiate from a different place? Not from short-term national self-interest, but from long-term collective global interest. And of course it doesn't take the politics away, but it helps us focus on another vision and it brings in a new perspective that is so often missing in those negotiations. So if that's the vision, there's a really obvious question. It's like, well, what are the determining factors that will figure out whether or not we can get into this space or not? What are the major influences that are pushing us out? And what are the major possibilities that could bring us in? And I'm going to present to you in a moment five that come up time and time again, just to run through some of the ideas and pressures that there are. But I would love just to take one minute, talk to the person next to you. What do you think? Come up with sort of single big concepts of what's going to determine whether or not we can get into that space. So I'll give you one minute. OK. Tell me some of the kind of single big concepts that you've been talking about that you think will determine our ability? Just shout them out. 
Willingness to cooperate. Okay, great. Vegetarianism, <laughs> fantastic. Education, equality, and equity. The three E's, I like it. Education, equality, and equity. Yep. Change consumption patterns. Change consumption Not patterns. Necessarily vegetarianism, but at least yes, yes. Yep, okay. Mm. One more? <laughs> Something completely different? Ban fossil fuel use. Great. Okay. All great points. And they're included in the five that I'm going to put up here. So five things that often come up. Population. There's usually somebody very cross who speaks first and says, what about population? So we're going to talk about population. Distribution, technology, governance, and economics. So I'm going to just briefly talk about these five and how they come into this, this picture. So starting with population. It comes up often. And I think it's a really important one to talk about. And the reason it comes up is because people see this graph. So here's up to where we are now, just in 2010. It's the growth of the world's population in terms of billions of people. And it's pretty steep. And no wonder Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb in 1968. Because in 1968, it really looked like a bomb and it was exploding. But when you look at this graph carefully, you see that the prediction at the top, that's, that's not an explosion, that's... That's plateauing, that's tapering off. And the really telling graph is not the absolute number of people, but the growth rate of population. This is from a book by Danny Dawling called Population 10 Billion. And I think it's a very insightful graph. So same graph, but on top of it, I've added the rate of population growth by year. This is what he's shown. And what, what you can see there is over time, there have been population growth rate has risen, for sure, and that's why we've had this steep curve up. But there have been moments where the population growth has really collapsed. And it's the First World War and a pandemic afterwards, the crash and the Long Depression, the Second World War in return, and the Great Chinese Famine. You can see at the top that massive drop in uh, point four. But after that, it's come down. And it's come down quite strongly. And the really good news is the population growth rate has come down in history for the first time because of success. Because every reason the population growth rate fell before was... Disaster, tragedy, war, failure, conflict, famine. Since the early 1970s, it's been falling because of success, because women have been educated, because children have been uh, surviving the first year of life, because women have got access to jobs and empowerment. And so it's actually women's empowerment and health care for children which brings down the population growth rate, because women are then empowered to choose about the size of their family, and that means we manage the size of the global population. So to me, it's a, it's a fantastic success story that's on the way. It's not the one that keeps me awake at night because I see it plateauing, whereas there are other trends that do not seem to be coming to a plateau. What about on the distribution? And often we get into a debate about its population, no, its consumption, and these two things are sort of, you know, people are on either side of the debate. Distribution of consumption and of resource use. And this is an extreme story, and I could use the donut to illustrate it. So there's the, where we are in terms of accessing the social foundation at the moment. And you can ask yourself, well, what would it take to get people out of that state of deprivation? Some people think, no, if we got everybody out of poverty, this would put huge pressure on the planet. And this is another good news story. I believe that you could get everybody out of poverty, resource poverty, without putting huge pressure on the planet. And here's why. We could end hunger for all with just 3% of the global food supply. So... That 13% of people who are currently living in hunger, you can ask, how much food would it take to bring them up to uh, being sufficiently uh, nourished? And it's the 3% of the current global food supply. That doesn't mean you actually take that literal 3% and get it to them. Of course, there's a huge logistical challenge, and you don't want to be importing food. You want people to be producing their own food. But at a level of material provisioning, that is extremely doable, especially when we put it in context that are between... Uh, 30 and 50% of the current food supply is lost in the supply chain, wasted post-harvest, or thrown away in our kitchens. So we're looking for 10% of what's not even being eaten at the moment to end hunger. And likewise, we can say uh, the International Energy Agency did an assessment and said, what would it take to get access to electricity to everyone using uh, a range of technologies, some fossil fuel, some wind, some solar? 
using a mix of technologies that would be appropriate, and they said it would result, we could get access to electricity for everybody with just a 1% in global carbon emissions. And that, again, is fantastic news, because it means if you want to tackle climate change, and if you care about energy poverty, these are completely separate issues. You don't tackle climate change by saying that people living in poverty can't have access to energy, because it's not the case. It's a tiny percentage. So then the question comes, well, obviously, where do you want to reduce emissions? And it's not a surprise. Let's go to the pressure on planetary boundaries. And you can see that wedge on climate change. I've divided it into two because researchers at Princeton University estimated that around 50% of the world's carbon emissions were produced in the name of 11% of people. I call it the global carbonistas. And we know that we live in the countries that are home to global carbonistas, and we are part of that community ourselves sometimes. Uh, so it's about rebalancing the emissions use of that high group. And secondly, if you take the nitrogen budget, if you, I've got a line there that shows a grey wedge. It's one third of what would be the sustainable nitrogen budget under the boundary. And that amount of reactive nitrogen is currently used to produce animal feed, to produce milk, uh, dairy and meat for Europe. So the lady who said vegetarianism, it's, it's certainly... Shifting the diet is certainly an important part of reducing our pressure on nitrogen and making space for other countries to use more nitrogen fertilizer to improve their diets. So it's about redistributing the resource use as well as reducing it. And of course, those data I just showed you are historic data because we're looking backwards, but we need to look forward as well because the pattern of uh, consumption is changing. Over the next uh, 20 years, we're going to see three billion more middle-class consumers, middle-class meaning people who have between $10 and $100 a day to spend. So coming in at maybe the $10 end of that, people who are now going to be buying more meat, bringing more meat into their diets, uh, using more of fossil fuel-based transport, all sorts of consumer goods, how will their consumption be catered for? How will we do that? And often at this point you say, oh, this is what we need, we need technology. Technologies are going to make this possible because we can use technology to create massive efficiencies and we can decouple resource use from provisioning. And of course, this is a massive revolution that we do need. But there's a, there's a danger that we overly rely on technological solutions and think that efficiency can provide all of this. So one of the huge shifts we need in technology is for physical and social technologies to transform resource use and impacts. So on the left-hand side, I've got the physical technologies that take us from resource intensive to resource efficient farming, from disposable to durable products, and from linear to closed loop systems. But of course, physical technologies go together with social technologies about the way we behave and interact with systems. It's not just the sheer mechanics of the system. So shifting from the idea of private ownership to public provisioning, from assets to service use, and from buying things to doing things. And these are some of the shifts that we all know are underway in people researching lifestyle change and behavior and interaction with people's behaviors with new technologies. Can we make these shifts? It's obviously a hugely important part, but I don't believe in itself it's going to bring us back in this space. In part because there are many different technologies that are possible. So in terms of uh, we, could have, we could have either geoengineering to reflect um, sunlight back into space, putting mirrors into space, or you could say, no, we're going to reduce carbon emissions per se and use solar panels. Or you could try and provide more food either through high-tech GMOs or um, you know, chemical research or biological varieties. Or you could say, no, we're going to do it through working with communities and their own varieties, their own seeds, and we're going to do it at the community-based level. And of course, a mix of the two. And the choices we make between these technologies are obviously extremely political and contested, and many actors have a say in it. I'm just going to pop up some actors who often get missed out, but these are the food companies, finance, fossil fuel companies, car companies, and all sorts of corporate lobby who have an influence on the regulation and the direction of technology that will have a huge influence. So it all comes back, in my mind, to governance, the question of how we govern these systems. And so the, all these different systems interlink. Can we govern ourselves? Uh, the first comment was, better cooperation, did you say? Yes. Um, and can we work together? Can we find governance systems that could do this? And of course, in order to do it, we need governance systems at many, many different scales, which is a challenge in of itself, and how will they relate? I like thinking of the global scale first, 
and the governance of the planetary systems. And if you look at the cloud formation there, you can see it's one global system, as is the hydrological cycle and the way the clouds form over one continent and rain falls over another. It's one interacting system. And the challenge we've got is that we've divided ourselves into over 200 little plots of land and called them countries. And here on this, you can see from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe and all the countries in between, We've made it very difficult for ourselves through that country base and the, the, the nationhood to then govern a system which is over all of us and it's actually one single whole. So I think that's one very big part of the governance challenge. But even if we could bring ourselves back within planetary boundaries, and this diagram tries to say, imagine some different pathways within boundaries, there are still choices to make. Even if we got over the social foundation and came back within planetary boundaries, Still different choices of how you meet that. Still different food and agricultural systems that could all be consistent in some way or other with living in that safe and just space. And so there are always going to be choices. There's no one right path. And as Melissa Leach, Melissa Leach at um, the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex has said, the choices amongst pathways are inevitably political. And amongst those following sustainable directions, which to pursue becomes a matter for democratic debate. And so this isn't just a scientific issue, it's a matter of, of democratic voice, of participation, and of societal choice. And it's a very interesting debate going on at the moment about the interface between science, uh, setting out and placing these planetary boundaries, and democratic choices. And how on earth do we make those choices? And in that paper that I did with Melissa and Johan Rockström, we said there are three Ds that you want to be thinking about when you're looking at different pathways through this safe and just space. The one is the direction. What direction are the different pathways taking? Are they, are they in the space or actually they're heading out of them? What are the interests driving them? Secondly, is there a sufficient diversity recognizing different social and cultural norms and ways of life so that different communities can meet their food needs or their energy needs or their health needs through diverse means? And thirdly, the very important one for me, the distribution, what are the implications for distribution? Where is the pressure? Who will be actually gaining or losing, whether on the social side or the environmental side, through these different choices? And all of these need to be part of democratic debate. But then I come back to the companies. I, I talked about the corporate table and what if every company did its business around that table. And this is a picture of a shareholder meeting because we need to think about corporate governance and what's driving corporate governance. So this is a shareholder meeting of a major American company. And all these shareholders have come to find out how are my shares doing and how is my return? And how do we transform that kind of governance that companies are looking for the financial return? Wouldn't it be amazing if in that shareholder meeting the company was talking to their shareholders about oh, we're a donut brand and what we're doing to get into that space? What if, you know, say maybe some progressive companies already do talk in these terms. They don't actually put up a giant donut on the screen. But they talk in terms of their contribution to sustainability and their contribution to well-being. What if it was actually required as part of corporate law that companies report around this? So there's all sorts of different ways that we could transform the governance to bring this into the heart of the way the business is done. And that takes me to the last one, the economics, the thinking about return and thinking about financial return and thinking about the way we conceptualize the economy and this is the one i'm passionate about rethinking because as i said at the beginning my journey was from economics and a frustration that it didn't address the issues i cared about and it's brought me back full circle so i like to imagine the relationship between economic growth and this donut and i would say this is a business as usual growth if you think of growth as an arrow over time GDP growing as that arrow gets longer. This is what, how I'd say in a very stylized way, the economy has traditionally grown. It's got people out of poverty, some people, in fact it's often left some people behind in poverty, but it's taken us over planetary boundaries because economic growth has been resource intensive and degrading because it's left the environment as an externality. And so it's gone over the boundaries right into that externality. And this is the kind of growth that we need to get away from. And so there's a current drive for green growth and green inclusive growth. I think there's a very important debate to be had around what that actually means. And there's a danger that so many people have the term green growth on their business label, on their business card, on their program, on their institution, that it shuts down an open debate about whether or not this is possible and are we heading there. And I'm, I'm worried that we're moving into an ideology of green growth without having open debate about whether or not it's feasible. To me, this is what green inclusive growth would have to look like. And it would be a different story for countries at different stages of development. So for a country, a low-income country, in which many people are still living in poverty, some not, and some living very well off, 
but many people still in poverty. The real question is, can we recouple economic growth with poverty reduction? Can we ensure that as the economy grows, it reduces poverty as fast as possible and gets people out of that space of deprivation in the middle, but does it in ways that doesn't lock us in to resource intensive use over time so that we won't eventually be able to decouple resource use from environmental pressure? If you're an emerging economy, fast growth, people are coming out of poverty and moving forward into the, the accelerated period that we've gone through, how do you ensure that you actually start decoupling resource use from economic growth and put in place the infrastructure, the urban design, the food system, the communication and energy systems that will decouple growth from resource use? A strong relative decoupling going on there. But to me, the real challenge is up here in our countries, in the high income countries, that have already shot out beyond their, let's say, fair share of the planetary boundaries. Is it possible to bend that curve in, to sufficiently, absolutely decouple continued GDP growth from resource use? And some commentators, such as Tim Jackson, who wrote Prosperity Without Growth, are extremely cynical about that and say it's just not possible on the scale. Others are extremely optimistic and say, with technology and transformation, we can do this. It's a huge journey, and I think, again, it's one that needs to be openly debated and not assumed that it's possible. So that's what green inclusive growth would have to look like in the donut space. And from a three-dimensional view, this is what it would look like. It would be an arrow of ever grow, you know, spiraling up. You'd see progress within that space, right? It's not shooting out beyond the donut, but it's in the space of safe and just space in its progress. And a really fundamental question to me is, if that arrow can spiral up and we can make progress, is it growth? Is it economic growth? Or is it prosperity? And are these the same things or different? And can we have high prosperity without unlimited economic growth? especially in high-income countries. Certainly, we need economic growth in low-income countries to get people out of poverty, but we need to ask the question about, is unlimited economic growth consistent with prosperity, and is it consistent with staying in this space? So to me, that's a very important question we need to be asking in economics. It's one that not many departments or institutions or governments want to ask, but I believe it's an important question for the 21st century. So those are the five dimensions that I wanted to talk about that often come up that are critical factors, and of course they're not all of them, a lot of the change that needs to happen actually is in here. It's in our heads. It's in the issues that many of you spoke of. Our consumption, desires, our expectations, our cooperation, our sense of sufficiency. But I want to leave it there and have a discussion with you um, what else you see and how you think of it from a food system perspective or what other issues should be brought in here. I'll just finally say that I'm blogging about this, these issues and I've got lots of resources on my website if you're interested and I'm doing so on Twitter as well. I'd love you to give me some comments there, give me some feedback and uh, I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you.